Welcome back to the Movie Babble Podcast. As always, you can find us online at moviebabblereviews.com. On this episode, you've got myself, Colin. I'm joined by Nick and Brennan as we talk about this week's top five, including new films, A Medea Family Funeral and Greta, as well as diving into some Academy Awards controversy from the past week. So starting with the top five from this weekend, we've got How to Train Your Dragon, The Hidden World, still at the number one spot with just a little bit over 30 million, followed by Tyler Perry's A Medea Family Funeral, opening with 27 million at the number two spot, Alita Battle Angel still hanging on at the number three spot with 7 million. The Lego Movie 2, the second part in its fourth week in the top five with 6.6 million and then green book uh jumping up the leaderboard quite a bit with the best picture bump unfortunately (laughs) with (laughs) 0.7 million (laughs) oh god we're gonna have to talk about that aren't we're gonna have to talk about that i guess i really don't want to (laughs) green book it it has to be discussed but before we get to that (laughs) how to train your dragon uh (laughs) Still holding on uh, pretty well, and I mean, I I guarantee it won't be in the number one spot next week, having to compete with Captain Marvel, uh, which is tracking for at least a hundred dollars, a hundred million dollars more. But Jesus. you know, it's it's had a pretty solid run these past two weeks. Uh, total gross is almost at a hundred million. Yeah, it's definitely gonna. I mean, obviously, it's gonna go over that mark, but it's. I think Universal did a really solid job of rolling this movie out in theaters because it started. Um, our boy Sean Coates in Australia saw this movie way back in like the second week of January when it came out over there, and it's been. We were the last people to get it here in the U.S., so it's been just like slowly like building word of mouth because I mean. Even though this is like the, th- the third leg of a trilogy here, this isn't like a. I wouldn't say this is like the biggest like event animation film like you would get from like some other studio or maybe like Pixar or something like that. So I think they did, they were really creative in how they rolled this movie out. And I mean, it's one hundred twenty nine million dollar budget, and it's reaching. It's definitely going to get over four hundred million and probably get five hundred million at some point. So really good job by them. It's good for everybody who got this movie this this trilogy end satisfyingly and it's doing really well so kudos to universal yeah for sure i think it's definitely a smart move uh that they took the, the approach with releasing this uh kind of slowly incrementally uh different different regions of the world and then finally here in north america just uh last weekend um it, it's doing a great job 375 million as you said worldwide and i think it definitely has a great shot at hitting uh the 500 million dollar mark um yeah next weekend captain marvel is definitely gonna Definitely going to be uh, what we're talking about. But for now, it's back-to-back weekends for uh, How to Train Your Dragon, The Hidden World. I think they can definitely be happy with uh, the numbers that they're putting up. Could we, um, we we might be able to see some sort of like lesser drop from this movie just because there's that, there's that effect that a lot of people that we don't realize sometimes when a movie like Captain Marvel comes out and there's so many people that go to the theaters to see it and they get locked out because of uh, sold-out tickets and whatnot. And so there's just whatever else is playing. And I could see How to Train Your Dragon, like, cleaning up with, like, a solid, like, less than 50% drop even next week. Maybe, like, an 18 or something like that. Just for that rollover effect. Um, could be entirely implausible. But I don't know. I think that's something to look forward to for next weekend. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think Alita could even see a bit of a mm-hmm. bump. Because it's... I agree. I mean, you're dealing with similar like style and and subject matter and whatnot. And so, I mean, yeah, they're definitely not going to be competing with Captain Marvel, but they'll benefit a little bit from it. Yes, sir. Yeah, hundred percent. And number two this weekend was uh, um, Tyler Perry's a Medea family funeral, which is reportedly the last time we're going to get to see a Tyler Perry's Medea character in a film. It opened up with a little over $27 million this weekend in its first weekend. That's a pretty strong gross given that the estimates were around 21, 22 range. 27 is definitely something that the studio is going to be happy about. 
Yep. I'm going to go full in on Tyler Perry for a second. Um, we, so we were talking about this before we, we got on here and this man is stupidly rich and let's say what you want about his movies. Um, like they're probably all very, not, not very good, like average to not very good, Mm -hmm. but there's something to be said about just work learning to, because apparently from everything I've heard and interviews and whatnot, he's great to work with and. Paramount gave him his own studio. He has Tyler Perry Studios, and he's just—he just works in the system. He understands his audience, his core audience, and what they want out of his movies, and he continually gives it to them every single time. And all these movies make money. It's amazing. Um, I think he does a lot of things to uh, just to kind of cut costs. And there was a movie, Nobody's Fool, last that came out last November with Tiffany Haddish, where. That movie literally, the entire movie, they literally filmed it in 10 days, which is not, it's only something you hear from like crazy, super small indie movies. Like he just figures out ways to cut costs and that's just going to keep getting you a job. And he has his TV stuff as well and everything, but uh, say what you want about his movies, but Tyler Perry is a great businessman. And I think this is just so impressive what he does. And it's, it's amazing. Good, good on you, Tom, Tyler Perry. Yeah, I mean, Tyler Perry is, he's kind of like Seth MacFarlane in a way that they're both yeah. like consistently out there putting stuff out. And I mean, a lot of it doesn't fit, like doesn't really connect, but they just have things like Medea or like Family Guy that connect and then run forever. Um, and yeah, they're they're always like out there doing things. So even Tyler Perry, despite the movies that he's made, he's been acting pretty consistently. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, he was in Vice last year. Um like he's he's just always out there grinding and <laughs> putting stuff out. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. crazy. He's he's always working. He's gonna come out with a few more films probably this year, and he's still working on TV. Like he's always working, and I don't know, great work ethic. This is kind, it's kind of crazy. It's really unprecedented this kind of run that he's on. It's amazing to me. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest takeaway as well from uh, Ambadia Family Funeral this weekend is that it was in essentially half the amount of theaters that How to Train Your Dragon 3 was in, and it still was about $3 million short of what the gross of How to Train Your Dragon 3 made. I mean, it is it, it was only in 2,400 theaters versus How to Train Your Dragon 3's uh, 4,200, and it was just $3 million short of uh, beating that film for the highest grossing uh, this weekend. So I think that's definitely one major takeaway, that he definitely has a base, and they're just going to keep coming out to see his movies. Yeah. I'd say, yeah, Tyler Perry, good job. You're you're doing something. You're mm-hmm. making a lot. You're making a lot of money. You are living comfortably, and you are making a lot of movies that a lot of a lot of people enjoy. So they don't really work for me, but they're working for a lot of other people. So good job. <laughs> Somewhere, somebody is anticipating the next Tyler Perry movie, so he's doing something right. <laughs> yeah, the Tyler Perry cinematic it? universe. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> this weekend uh, was Alita Battle Angel uh, it was second spot last weekend bumped down to number 3 this weekend with the new release it made 7 million dollars that's a 43% drop so it's up to 72 million dollars domestically I'm definitely going to debate with you guys on this one I'm going to call it yet again as I said last week there will be another Alita I'm telling you it's it's tough I don't know It's so I've seen estimates where it's like 500 million to 550 is like what they need to like make a start making a profit. So, I mean, we're still a ways from that, but it's kind of chugging along overseas. It's a lot of, um, it, we're, it, it debuted really solidly in China and opened up in a bunch of markets this week, which is why it's gross bumped up to 350. Um, I, again, I, I, I kind of like this. I like this movie quite a bit. It was really weird and all over the place, but I kind of liked it. Um, and it seems like audiences who have seen it ha- have really liked it. Um, the Rotten Tomatoes, like, uh, audience score is, like, really, really solid, like, in the 90s or something like that. I'm pretty sure the cinema score was also really great, too. Um, I don't know. I feel like we could – you're right. We could slowly see it creep keep creeping and keep getting money. And I mean, I don't know. They might want to make another Alita movie on a lesser budget. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. It's 
maybe do something like 120 or 100 million if possible. But I mean, I call this one a flop right out of the gate, and I'm not I'm not willing to give that up quite yet. Okay, that's fair. Because it has a lot of work. I think it has a lot of work left to do, yeah. and it'd be kind of silly just to say, oh yeah, 150 million more, and no problem, it'll get that. So, um, cautiously optimistic because I kind of want to see more out of this world and all this craziness, but I don't know. I, it's, I have no idea yet. It's, I'm, I'm definitely going to keep an eye on it over the next few weeks. Yeah. It's definitely one to watch. Um, it, you know, as far as performance at the box office goes again, I'm more on the doubtful end of whether or not it'll get a sequel. Um, especially with Disney owning Fox within in the next seven days, potentially. <laughs> um, so, I think it might be something that just kind of gets thrown asunder. So like um, kind of speaking about Disney and Fox a little bit like Dark Phoenix, um, there was another trailer for that this week and you can already tell they're just like, you know what? This franchise is over. We're just going <laughs> to cut off all our loose ends and then Disney can do whatever they want with what's left over. And I feel like Alita is going to kind of fall into the same position. I mean, I, I'm, I'm hoping that's not the case, but I mean, you look at this film, you look at, at, at the money it's making overseas, as we said, $350 million. Um, I, I think it's close. I think it's close to that sequel range. I mean, obviously, as you said, Nick, it's tough to just say, oh yeah, another $150 million and it'll get a sequel. I mean, pushing that, that, that could be pushing it. That could be pushing the limits. Uh, I don't know if it has the capability of making another $150 million, uh, globally, but I will say, uh, me and Colin spoke about this last week, and as you said now, just lower scale, lower budget. I mean, it's such a grand world. It'd be so hard to cut the budget drastically because all the uh, CGI and special effects that go into this uh, sort of film. But I think that it would definitely be smarter, as you said, maybe around 100, 120 range. I think they could definitely do another uh, film in this franchise. I really want to see something, though, because the world building in Alita was kind of in your face, but it also left me quite intrigued. Yeah, it's 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 an outlier as far as big budget big budget movies go this, these days. It's just a weird movie, and I kind of really appreciate it on face value. But yeah, it's Disney is trying to cut ties with a lot of what Fox is doing right now. Um, yeah, the Dark Phoenix thing is just very blatant. I felt like, um, but it's so I think it's everything is up in the air at this point. So you could. You could see Disney being like, yeah, we can do something better with that. Let's do it or whatever. And honestly, I don't know how they would do that because Alita is like the most violent PG-13 movie I've ever seen, <laughs> like ever. Like yeah. that movie is just really angry and I, I really liked it in that respect. But And there was one F-bomb as well. Yeah, there was. And that's not going to fly with Disney at all. Um, <laughs> um, and neither, neither would smoking or just any other weird things that Disney doesn't like in their movies. But um, – yeah, I don't know. This is this is a weird one. It's I think it was destined to be a weird one, just with how it was rolled out and just the kind of the movie itself. So I don't know. No See, idea. What, <laughs> what they haven't told you is that this is actually a uh, Avatar sequel, kind of in the ah. same field. How none of them are really related. <laughs> there you so go. So it's it's the one. Oh, he is the James Cameron's come out with like those really weird names for his avatar movies where it was, it was like avatar colon water or some shit like that. Uh, <laughs> uh whatever. James Cameron's a weird guy, but he makes really interesting movies. <laughs> I, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. <laughs> All right. On that note, I think we should probably move on. <laughs> yep, um, okay. So uh, <laughs> we got the Lego, Lego two, uh, Lego movie two coming in and forth. And, this movie is just like slowly just making me sad just because I really like it. It's so funny. And I never knew I wanted uh, tennis playing Raptors in my life until I saw this movie. <laughs> and now I do and I need it. And it's just kind of a bummer. I'm, I've seen estimates of like a, around $100 million for this for, for this budget. So yep. I, it's it's sitting at 150 and the news of other toy lines probably getting movies. I just, I'm just not seeing much life here and it's it's just kind of bumming me out. Yeah. It makes me sad because I love Phil Lord and Chris Miller. And I mean, they did a phenomenal job with the first Lego movie with this one and it's just not wowing audiences, I guess it's pretty low opening. It's just kind of barely, chugged along and especially once captain marvel shows up its audience is going to dry up a little bit more 
Yeah, I wonder. It's. I mean, there's definitely Lego fatigue going on in general, but I, f- I feel like there was just a big miscalculation on what was on Warner Brothers' part about what draws people to these movies. I feel like they thought that they could differ- differentiate each Lego movie based on like the sheer number of IP, like the sheer IP that they could play with, because they all just because you have like all the DC stuff thrown in there and just all a bunch of random other stuff. But then I think audiences just, just looked at all these Lego movies as just Lego movies. And they all mm-hmm. kind of follow that eccentric kind of zippiness. So I feel like it's just they just thought this was going to be more of the same, which it kind of is. But it's just, it just has that Lord, that, that Lord Miller flavor on there. It's so much fun. It's just, just a delight from start to finish. But yeah, it's, I don't think there's really much new to report here, but it's just kind of sad. <laughs> it just keeps. It's, I think it's worth worth mentioning again and again because it's a really good movie. Yeah, I'm hoping maybe it'll by the end um, break even. I don't think it's going to make much of a profit at all, but I think that this movie could like maybe skid past breaking even because I mean I don't know what the marketing uh, totals are, but a hundred million dollar budget, the new uh, factor in marketing. Um, it, it's just it's a sad it's a sad story for sure for the Lego movie. I I I'm, it's sad because I wanted to see a Lego uh, Lego Justice League movie, um, but that would have been I amazing. Think, I don't think Warner Brothers <laughs> is gonna be uh, advancing too much with big theatrical Lego releases. Um, I think as we spoke about in previous weeks, it's pretty pretty likely that we'll maybe see some directed DVDs or Netflix uh, Lego movies in the future, lower budget, very small scale. But this is just. Uh, it's tough to watch. I mean, I think I was definitely very wrong with how I thought this movie would turn out with its box office numbers. Yeah, it's a bummer. So, uh, segueing into the angry part of the podcast, yay! Five, <laughs> we have Green Book <laughs> with quite the bump, up one hundred and twenty-one point four percent from last week, with four point seven million. Uh, definitely getting some. Best picture attention right now. <laughs> I got a little yeah. disclaimer here before we start. I must say, I out of the eight nominees, this is the only film I didn't get the chance to see out of the eight best picture nominees. <laughs> that much towards something, I don't know, but I'm just gonna stay a little bit out uh, while you guys banter along about this uh, Green Book. Okay. In the so baseball. okay, so um, I think we can all agree that Green Book was probably not the best choice. Uh, for best picture um i mean there's just a lot of they've it's been beaten to death and as far as film industry news recently just kind of all the things that were wrong they didn't talk to the shirley family and nick valalonga isn't exactly the greatest dude if you look into some of his history and it's it's a mess and i don't really like this movie very much at all i thought it was it was fine as i saw probably 100 movies last year that i liked more than this movie um <laughs> It's just, it's just the most safe and like warm and fuzzy movie that like just all boomers will like love and gush over. And I think that's kind of why we saw it win Best Picture uh, this this past weekend. But it's just such a safe movie, and I've seen it like in my screening when I saw this movie back in November. It's it it's just there, there was just that older audience. It really just they ate it up and they loved it. It's it really, it's it connected with a lot of people, and I find that really fascinating. But I don't think that's a good thing for where we are now. But um, it's yeah, it's as far as box office goes, it's really been chugging along. It was like at one point they were con- it was considered kind of a flop, like it really did not open well at all. Mm-hmm. And then and then somehow it's just kind of just been slowly just matriculating and over time and getting money and. I mean, now it has the it's had the the awards bump for the last few weeks, which has really helped it. But Green Book is uh, I don't really I just I'm just so tired of this movie. I just uh, I just want it to disappear, and it's it's just a bummer. I don't want to hear Nick. I don't want to hear Viggo Mortensen's Italian uh, caricature anymore. I'm 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 tired. Colin, it's all yours. I'm exhausted over here. <laughs> yeah, Green Book. <laughs> I mean. I've t- talked a little bit about it before um, with this year's best picture nominees. I feel like there aren't re- like if you, if you put most of the movies that were nominated for best picture up against any other year's uh, combatants, most of them wouldn't stand a chance. Like it, it would be 
by a mile for anything to win. Um, so we have a lot of underwhelming movies that are nominated this year. So I've been pretty vocal about Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> I love <that. laughs> I loved Vice, but again, I don't think it's best picture worthy. Uh, Green Book was one of those I kind of pegged for that. I loved Black Panther, but I'm going to be one of those people that says I don't think it deserved best picture. I think it got the nomination because it got carried over from the best popular category they had for a couple months. Um, but yeah, I think Green Book just misrepresents the story it's trying to tell in a year where you have Black Klansman, which is just this really striking uh, look at racism in America and you know race relations in general. And then you compare it to something like Green Book, which is the kind of happy, flowery version of that that makes everything seem almost Disneyified, where it just kind of ends happily. Um, I think it's kind of an insult to Black Klansmen on that front. And then even just as a story, like if you look aside from the politics and kind of the social commentary of it, I think even just as a story, it doesn't make sense. Like the character of uh, Nick Vallelonga himself, he just like they there's a scene early on in the movie that you probably remember where like the there are these workers at his house drinking from a cup. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're both yep. like African American workers and he sees them drink from the cup that his wife had offered him. He throws the cup in the trash. Um, like later she pulls it out. And so you're like, okay, like you're introduced to this character, you know he's kind of racist. And then like they just they never touch on that ever again. Like he just hops in the car with Don Shirley and like all of his um disagreements with race and like with Don Shirley's sexuality are just kind of overlooked and they're like nope they're best friends now and so I think even just as a movie like it really fails <laughs> yeah it's did, did you guys know that racism is bad like <laughs> I did not know that yeah it's it's crazy it's it's a really interesting idea um I mean I don't want to th- I mean people like this movie and I've heard a lot of discussion about um a really interesting discussion saying if it's it's pursuits, it's trying to be, and at its core, it's trying to do something good. You know, like, the idea of it is racism is bad. Like, yeah, of course. So that's like, should we really be knocking on it that hard? And um, maybe, maybe not. Um, my point is, this kind of movie shouldn't win Best Picture. <laughs> if we're looking for a movie with a good, uh, that has maybe a good message, like, but is kind of squirrely and how it goes about it like that's not best picture worthy uh comp- competency isn't necessarily shouldn't be rewarded um and you, you mentioned black Klansmen. we had movies like sorry to bother you and blind spotting there's so many other interesting movies that had really interesting things to say about racism and culture and just it's just, we have the movie where Viggo Mortensen teaches Marshall Ali how to eat fried chicken as the best picture <laughs> winner so um yeah this movie is just uh it's just it's whatever it's it's just it's, just, I just, it just feels backwards after a couple of years of really interesting choices for best picture so whatever it's it happened if you had told me that the guy that directed dumb and dumber dumb and dumber 2 in shallow Howl was going to win <laughs> yes best picture i wouldn't have comprehended it and i still don't understand but that's where we are uh, as a society, apparently. Yeah. Um, um, it's, it's, hey, it's making a lot of money, and some people really like it. And if people are coming out of this movie with more, like, positively, and they're thinking, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm missing something. Maybe other, it's, this is a really interesting piece of film, filmmaking for a lot of different people that has some really interesting things to say. And, it's it's positive, and to those people, I say good for you. But I just I don't see it. It's just it's just one of those movies that comes around every while that it's just like desperately trying to be a crowd pleaser, and somehow it became a crowd pleaser, and no one really stopped to see all its bullshit within it. So, yeah, I think I'm done. <laughs> I'll, touch on, I'll touch on one thing for this film, uh, just numbers wise. Uh, 180. Oh yeah, please let's let's actually get back to the point of this podcast. <laughs> 188 million uh, worldwide is what Green Book's at now. So that that's 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 quite the number for um, a film like this. Yeah, worldwide it's, it's, as well. It's doing really yeah. well. That that kind of goes in. It tapped it tapped into something with a lot of people, and a lot of people resonate with this 
what what this movie has to say. And I mean, yeah, twenty three million dollar budget, one hundred eighty eight worldwide. Uh, I can't. Uh, it depends per movie, obviously, but um, Oscar campaigns typically run around twenty million, and you have the marketing on top of that. Like this movie is a hit, and it's going to continue. I mean, and it's just, it has that the moniker of best picture now. So it's going to just have great legs and home video and all type of streaming rights and things like that. So this is a really big deal as far as just for universal as, how, as a property, as something that they can just sell off to people. Cause it's going to, going to make a lot of money from now, from now on to the for the rest of eternity. And when people will still watch it, um, whether or not that's a good thing is totally different. Um, and I think we've both kind of discussed what we think on that. So yeah. Whatever. Green Book, you're, you're making money. Cool. I mean, we'll all forget about Green Book as best picture when the Aladdin reboot wins it next year. So, yes, <laughs> very true. Or when Show Dogs 2 wins in 2021 <laughs> uh, or just whatever. Yeah. We'll, we'll have something else to yell about around this time next year. So it'll be ancient history. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. I mean, the Oscars, no matter what, no matter what's uh, in the running, I think. I think there's always going to be uh, people angry no matter what. Uh, and I think that's just something that we have to accept. Um, I mean, I think probably Roma would probably be the only real safe uh, Best Picture winner. I think that would have probably caused the least amount of controversy. I don't know if I'm wrong there, but I mean, no matter what, I think award shows with that pedigree usually are going to cause a lot of controversy. Yeah, we've just seen – it's really interesting what we've seen with the Academy this year because we saw just a lot of – strife and it seems like there's like multiple like there's like it feels like there's like a younger section of the academy that really wants these interesting and i wouldn't say interesting because that would invalidate the other side but just these progressive and just really strong like pieces of pieces of filmmaking and then we have kind of what the the what we've seen from years in the past where people where it's just like we want don't want things to change and uh just looking for it's another driving Miss Daisy all over again, quite literally almost. So it's just, it's really fascinating to kind of see how the Oscars and the Academy are broken down. And it's just really interesting. It felt like a lot of it was pretty on the surface this year. So we'll see. Um, it's really interesting. Like I said, I, I laughed when I saw green, that green book one and I thought it was pretty funny that we've made this best picture. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm annoyed. And this is my pod. This is a podcast where I can be angry for a hot second, but We'll be okay. Something else. We'll watch something else, and we'll I'll watch Roma a hundred more times before I ever see this movie again. And <laughs> a best a best picture win isn't going to really change that. So it's whatever. We we can we'll live. <laughs> we'll be okay. <laughs> um, so some other <laughs> notable box office stuff. Uh, Greta opened up this week. Didn't crack the top five, but did crack the top ten. Uh, coming in with four point. Five, almost four point six million dollars. Yeah, shout out to Greta. I actually saw this movie this week, and it was one of the few I only got to check out because I was pretty busy. But um, it's just a super pulpy, uh, straight to DVD movie that has really good actors in it and a really good director. So it's really slick and it's just kind of gross and. Um, it's, I kind of enjoyed it. It was just, it was kind of nightmare fuel for me, for me, because it wasn't very super, it wasn't supernatural at all. It was just crazy, crazy mm. people doing crazy things. Uh, and then it, there's some claustrophobia stuff in there, which if you've seen the movie, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And that was just kind of, just really unnerving for me. But um, yeah, this movie doesn't really do much different, which is why I can imagine it didn't do great at the box office, because I could see people seeing this trailer and saying, like, oh, I've seen this so many times before. Um, and you have. So, um, yeah, nothing. there's nothing really new to report about this movie. It's just a decently made kind of schlocky and just, yeah, just one of these paranoid thriller movies about stalkers. So it's it's the same. It's We've seen this so many times. <laughs> and it's, just, it's just, yeah, it's what it is. Uh, I can't imagine it's going to do very well with, in terms of legs. Uh, I mean, it's made $5 million almost 5 million worldwide. And I think it's just going to go fade off into obscurity pretty quickly. And you'll see on Netflix in a couple of weeks, a couple of months and be like, Oh, that was a movie that I thought I saw. I might watch it. Then you watch like 40 minutes of it. And be like, Oh, okay. 
and then you move on with your life. <laughs> so that's that's my analysis of Greta. <laughs> I also want to touch on Climax this weekend. That's a film that uh, premiered at the Cannes Film Festival last year. Uh, A24 mm-hmm. picked it up for distributing rights here in the United States. It was out in uh, five uh, theaters across the uh, across North America this past weekend, and it won the uh, average per theater of twenty four thousand uh, dollars this weekend. That's a film that I'm looking forward to seeing. Uh, hopefully, at some point. Um, so one hundred and twenty one thousand dollars out of five theaters for that this weekend. That's a that's a pretty pretty reasonable start here in North America. Yeah, I really want to see this movie. I've heard it's insane, which I love and. I haven't seen um, this ga- it's Gaspar No. I don't know how to say his last name. Noé. It's French. Noé, yeah. That's right. Uh, Noé. Yeah, he's uh, made a couple films uh, so far that he's just – he's he's one of those directors that's just like actively in your face and trying to shock you And from what I've heard. And, and apparently this movie is more of the same in that respect. So, uh, um, yeah, I, I do want to see it though because uh, Sofia Patel is in it and she is – crazy athletic and apparently she does some really really cool dance moves and this is apparently really interesting so i'm interested to see that um yeah (laughs) yeah and i think uh two more films just to touch on real quick Mm -hmm. um so spider verse is i mean it's best animated feature um so it got a little bit of a bump uh with a two million dollar haul this weekend and then apollo 11 uh, the documentary that used archival footage of the Apollo 11 mission um, yes, opened with a pretty limited release, um, only 120 theaters, but still managed to pull in 1.6 million. Um, so it's pretty impressive for for that to kind of start off this year's documentaries. Yeah, so yeah it's that at Sundance, right? I want to hear a little bit of uh, your. Yeah, case. it's absolutely. Um, so I'm pretty sure this movie this movie is expanding wide um, this week. I don't know quite how wide that might be. I mean, documentaries, when they go wide, it's around like kind of around 2000 screens. Um, I don't really have much information. That's my guess. But uh, really, really good movie. This was one of my favorite movies to come out of Sundance. Um, I got I was really just impressed by the director. I listened to the director talk about this movie. And he mentioned how they were always this is because this year is the is the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission. So they were going to always do something uh, to celebrate it. And then when the director was working with the national archives uh, and up here in DC for, to put something together, they found like hundreds and thousands of hours of footage and audio and everything. And so basically it turned into this crazy um, just, one thing that was unprecedented it was like they had to save all this footage that they didn't know they had and it's just a really really interesting uh film and the it's it's beautiful to look at it's i think they they cleaned all the footage and it made it 65 millimeter i think um so it's just a really cool imax experience i'm glad they rolled it out in imax because it's so cool and it really makes it makes first man better in retrospect because they got so much right with that movie and you just you literally see the the lunar lander drop to the moon from fifty thousand feet up in the air or in space, I guess, which is like it's it's so cool and it's it's really awesome. Um, I hope people see it because of this recommendation. It's really cool. Uh, it'll probably be one of my favorite movies of the year. I think it's really fascinating and it's incredibly well produced. It's really slick. Um, yeah, I love this movie. I really hope it does well. Um, and it's. And by my count, it finished second in the in the per screen average, or third, third or fourth, right around there. But it did really well to start out in 120 screens. So I hope yeah, the best. Yeah, put on my list for sure. Yeah, I'm definitely yeah. gonna put that on my it's list. Really now. solid movie. Really, really solid movie. Sweet. So yeah, I think that kind of wraps up the box office for this week. And then next week will be pretty large for Disney, um, kind of kicking off their next few months of big films because i've got captain marvel and then dumbo is in three weeks i believe yeah i think so and that'll kind of throw us into disney dominating the box office for the next four months and the rest of our lives (laughs) yep exactly exactly yep get ready for it (laughs) 
<laughs> Any uh, predictions, you guys, for the opening weekend numbers of Captain Marvel? I'm going to go a cool 125. I think that's a decent number. Yeah, I'd say I'm probably going to sit around there as well. Maybe a little bit higher. Maybe around like 130, 135. I'm going to go 115. Um, I think, yeah, I, I think the expectations... It, I mean, it's still coasting off of Infinity War steam. And so it doesn't you know, directly tie in, at least to my knowledge. But, I mean, people are pretty hungry for anything Marvel right now. And so I, I think it'll do pretty well despite the uh, Rotten Tomatoes fiasco over the past week yeah that's a thing that it's just annoying but um it's i think yeah i think that and the marketing hasn't been great for this movie in my personal opinion I, it just looks like another movie another marvel movie um but at this point i mean marvel has has so much goodwill you just throw that marvel logo on it and people are going to go see it so um i can't i can't imagine this will be any different so it's going to do yeah, really well 100 percent. i think you're definitely right to just slap the logo on there you're going to get you're going to get a good first weekend you're going to make some money and i think rotten tomatoes all i got to say i think they made the right decision yes sir i agree so i think that kind of wraps it up for this week Thanks for listening to this episode of the Movie Babble Podcast. Again, you can check us out online at moviebabblereviews.com and join us next week as we talk about Marvel Studios' 21st film, Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel.